Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello, dear viewer and dear listener, and welcome to a rather invigorating and, and a super exciting episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. I'm your host, Mumpulu Giluruma Mohobe. As always, I try to bring you life-changing business information. I try to find you guests who are empowering guests who make a difference. And today is no different. And I have a special guest who's from across, when I'd say that, is from SA, but let the guest introduce himself. As always, I leave it to the guest uh, to say one or two things about himself. Welcome, Mr. Witness Mdaka. Say, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for making time uh, mm-hmm. to do this interview. Um, yeah, introducing myself, my name is Witness Mdaka. I'm a young investor in property. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also the author of a book called It's More Than Just Money, Mm -hmm. a guide to escaping the red race and building generational wealth, Mm -hmm. uh, which was specifically written uh, to unearth potential Mm -hmm. in young Africans and help them build businesses, invest in property. We're going to Uh, talk a lot more about that, but give us a a little bit about your academic uh, background and so on. Yeah. So interestingly enough, before I get into my academic background, so, let me start my story here. I was born in, in a hut, in a place called Limpopo in Guyane, mm-hmm. in Kanzanan. And shortly after that, my parents were separated around when I was eight months old. Oh. And then I went on to stay with my great-grandmother, uh, who taught me a lot of things about business because we were selling ice, you know, lollipops mm-hmm. back in the day. you know. And then I went on to stay with my mother when I was about 12 years old. Then in the year 2007... Mm. Uh, must have been 18 at the time. My mother discovered that she overpaid her house by 150,000 rands. Mm. And then she took that money and built back rooms at home in Tembisa. She overpaid and the bank, in other words. Yeah. So, no, no. The, the bank was uh, it was settled a long time ago. She was just not aware because she, oh. she had been paying extra into a bond and she overpaid mm-hmm. by 150k so that money is just lying there it was the lying there and she was not aware so they, she was made aware of that uh, and then she took the money and built back rooms at home in Tembis and said if I want to go to university I must manage and look after those back rooms and those tenants so she built the back rooms but she's, she had never collected any rental from them wow. you know the first person that came and he wanted to pay I remember at the time there was still, she had just finished building them and there was not even electricity in the rooms. Mm. And the first tenant that came, is uh, his name was Julius Kotokwan. Yeah. Uh, and Julius took out money wanting to give it to my mother. It was 800 rands at the time. Mm. And my mother said to him, no, don't don't give the money to me. Give it to my eldest son, uh, which is the one that she's going to be collecting rental from you uh, from now on. So getting into my academics, I went on. Uh, to get, so you became a landlord. I became a landlord at, at the age, age of eighteen. <laughs> yeah, so I was a landlord, and those people were giving me a run from for my money. Some yes. would dodge me. Yeah. Some would tell me stories. And speaking of Julius, he once wrote me a letter. He had mm. not paid rent mm. for about three months, and in the letter he said to me, "If you sell my stuff, I'm going to kill you." Oh. And and he disappeared. Oh. And that was the last time I heard of Julius. Uh, be there as it may. Left his property in the. Yeah, a new TV, a couch. I sold everything. I kept the couch because it was nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and put it in my room <laughs> to recover, the, to recover, <laughs> to the, recover the debt. But that's how I was introduced mm. into the property industry. At the time, I didn't think of it as a business. Mm. I didn't know it was a business. Were well, you not afraid I, Julius might come back? No, I wasn't. Mm. I wasn't because, okay. uh, I mean, we grew up in the township, you know. Um, my elder brother back in the days was killed because he was part of a gang. He was a gangster. Oh. So 
that sort of being afraid of someone that was not it was not so, in me yeah yeah, yeah i wasn't yeah. that's not the kind of yeah. life i was used Fear to it's not part of your vocabulary it was not part of my vocabulary <laughs> at the time it was more of if he, let him come back yeah, yeah. i want to see what's gonna happen yeah, yeah yeah you know but uh be that as it may i went on to get a bachelor of business administration degree uh, and then I went on to get a postgraduate degree in project management. Mm. Um, I worked for a marketing. It's like a master's. Yeah, it's more, no, it's like an honors. Honors, it's honors. It's honors equivalent. Okay. Yeah, because it's, it's a postgraduate diploma. Yes. Right. And then I, I worked for a marketing company for 14 months. I started off as a campaign manager. Well, I went in as an intern. Then I was a campaign manager. Then I was a, I was uh, the trainer of all national uh, brand ambassadors within the company. Mm -hmm. And then I became an accounts manager all within 14 months. Mm -hmm. Then then I I had reached my ceiling. Uh I quit my job. Wow. Uh, and a friend of mine, his name is Gift. Um, You found that the the place was now too small for you. You're growing at a faster rate than the place. I was growing at a faster rate. I enjoyed my job. I loved marketing. I loved the industry. I loved my job. Mm. My bosses loved me. I loved them. I was Mm. in a good place. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I felt like there was a strong need for me to get into business and get into it Mm -hmm. full-time because it had always been something that I had wanted to do for myself. Um, and I think around that time, because we were also running a, a spaza shops with a friend of mine, Gift. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, speaking of Gift, when when I started in the property industry, the first book that I read was Rich Dad Poor Dad. Okay. Know? We're like in the we train. Are, yeah. We're in a train to Pretoria to register our first business. It was a recycling business mm-hmm. with this friend of mine, Gift. Mm-hmm. And he took out this book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. He gave it to me. He said, Mchana, do you read? And I said, oh, well, I read, but what do you mean? Yeah. Then he gave me the book and said, read this book. And I was on a train and the train got stuck mm-hmm. halfway through to Pretoria. Then I read that book. I read literally half of it. because the, the And I was just glued to this book. Mm. I could see myself. Because I'm like, oh, I've been managing uh, these units. I've been running this business. Mm. And, and then I just continued mm. uh, to read the book and realize that from this book, I'm not only gaining the nuggets that I need, mm-hmm. but I'm also starting to identify with the property industry in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, fast forward when then now I quit my job, Gift and I were just running these puzzle shops and um, he's, we decided to sell mm-hmm. and he went on to become a statistician. No. So, it's, it's, so it's very academic, mm. right? And and I, and I that's one of the toughest subjects, statistics. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. So you have to be a, really super smart. He became a, uh, he got a master's in statistics and mm. all of that. Mm. But for me, I went on to the basics and said, "What is the one business that I've always been good at?" Mm. And I realized I've been collecting rent all these years, mm. and that has always been the most stable of all businesses. You know, no one steals the money. I mean, with shops, so, so it's almost like Kiyosaki confirmed it for you. What you've already been doing. Yeah, he confirmed it for me. Mm. I can say he brought in the academic part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, although he's not really an academic, but that mm. part. Yeah, the fact that I could see myself. Mm. within the pages of that book mm. i realized it's confirmed it's yeah. me it's what i do mm. and then the desire to then uh go strong in the property industry then came uh, then i started a construction company wow. uh, then then that construction company over the years was mm. built into a property development business okay. and i went full on into so the you you're not into acquisition you're not acquiring finished products yeah. you chose to build for yourself or were you doing a little bit of both it was a little bit like of I both do, do yeah both. it was a little bit of both because um on the construction side i was constructing for other people mm. so you you would need a house mm. would construct for you would do the configurations if you configuring your house mm. or doing renovations and then and then realize that but I've, i'm gaining the skill mm-hmm. and remember also i was now studying project management and, and and then I was doing it in practice. Then I thought, okay, this I can take and this apply. This is in the early, well, late 2000s. I would say 20. now it's the years 2012, 13, 14, 15. Okay, okay. Because uh, I, I got my postgrad in 2015, mm-hmm. right? That's when I was doing it. But now I was full on okay. uh, in, in, in the property space. That's mm-hmm. what I was focused on. Because I worked for the marketing company 2013. 
and left them early 2014. Mm-hmm. Right, so that 14 month string. How was uh, the property market in Sanzi at that time? So at that time, remember also for me, it was more of I was I had a a, ta- a stint in the township because of what my mother had built for me. Mm-hmm. So the understanding around it was a, a numbers game to say, okay, if you've got rooms, because it was rooms that mm. my mother had built, mm. right? My mother was not planning to become a developer. Mm. She just wanted to build rooms so she could get extra income. Yes. But I looked at that and said, why should people just have normal rooms where they sleep and they share a toilet and a bathroom? Mm. Let's build self-contained units. Let's build studio apartments. Uh, let's build units where they have dignity, mm. like a kitchen, a bathroom. So I started doing that. And from the 800 that she was charging, 800 to 1,000, I was now charging 3,000. Mm. Then I realized, oh, hang on. There's a market here. There are people that are willing to pay. More specifically because you've got young professionals mm-hmm. uh, migrating from the rural areas. Now somebody would come to Joburg to study, mm-hmm. for instance. Now when they get there, they study, they get their first job, then they need to stay in a proper yeah. in a proper place. But they don't want to pay the amount that you would pay if you're renting like a two, three bedroom apartment in a place like Mid Rent or Centre yeah. in Kempton Park. Mm-hmm. Right. So they want the same kind of quality but at an affordable rate. Mm-hmm. And that that was what uh, the key turning point was mm-hmm. for me to then realize so this is the like market a niche I'm going market to see. you discovered. It became a niche market. Mm-hmm. But that market is actually quite broad as well because South Africa has got a, a lot of young mm. professionals, more specifically young black professionals that want to be uh, living in units that are, are nice and you because mm. they wanna mm. you, they wanna buy a car. You know okay. how people are; they wanna live in a, a unit that's affordable but that's nice. Yeah. But they were not gonna drive a nicer car than the landlord, and and which was okay, mm. and and which was what. I want to talk a little bit about the mindset. Yeah. You've read what Kiyosaki says. Yeah. You've experienced with your grandmother setup. Yes. Tell me the the setup now when you're now converting it from just the way something you've read on paper to a business model. For sure. How did you structure it? So for me, it was simple. You know, uh, if you want to do business, you're looking at need number one. I looked at it and said, okay, is there a need for this thing? And then realized, okay, when my mother built rooms, literally after she was done, Julius was at the door mm. wanting to pay for a room that they didn't even have electricity. Mm. Then I thought, okay, there is a need. The right? demand. There's a demand for this thing. And then I thought, but could there be scale and magnitude, mm. right? Can Is this thing scalable? Can I can I become a millionaire out of this thing? Can mm. I make a million? Mm. And I thought, okay, if at the time, mm. I thought, if I've got 1,000 rooms, it means 1,000 people are giving me 1,000 every month, then it means I'm, I've got a million yeah. cash <laughs> flow coming in. So I looked at it from that perspective mm-hmm. and that allowed me to see the scale within the business that, mm-hmm. okay, there is an opportunity for you to scale and grow the business. And then I looked at magnitude. Can Can you do projects at a large scale? No, projects that can literally now have value mm. if you do them and do them well. And I thought, okay, there is an opportunity to do that. Mm. Now, do I necessarily have to fund it myself? That's now the academic side of me yes. thinking about the market in South Africa. And I thought, no, if you build enough relationships with people that are willing to invest in projects mm. and you demonstrate the capacity to manage and manage it well, somebody is always willing to fund it, mm. be it the bank and obviously, the bank will always fund anyone who wants to buy a property. Yeah, but that's anyway. something that a lot of our brethren are struggling with. You hear a lot of say, people saying, hey, banks are difficult, funding is difficult, mm-hmm. getting funding is a struggle. Yeah. But from what I'm hearing, you have a totally different experience. Yeah, I think it's also a totally different mindset because I exposed myself to mentors. Mm. White, black, Indian, you know, and the conversations are different. The black mentors, for me, represented me. When I looked at them, I saw a mirror. Mm. And this guy says, no, I'm doing a deal. The bank is funding my development. And I'm like, okay, banks fund black people. Mm. It's confirmation to me. Yes. And I sit with a, a white mentor and he says, no, I'm doing a project. It's about 600 million rands. I'm going to sell it to a pension fund. Pension fund mm. funds buy buildings from people. So that sort of exposure mm. then mm. showed me that. Because mm. he told me, no, I... 
like I'll, I'll tell you one of the deals he did he's like mm. i'm going this to is your mentor now. my mentor is like he did this deal he's a quantity surveyor mm. and he got other professionals involved like from the architect to the engineers and everybody else they designed he went to someone who owned land in a, in a certain province mm-hmm. right in the western cape and he said i want to build a mall in this land but I'm going to give you an option to buy the property. I'm not giving you an offer to purchase. Mm. I'm giving you an option to buy. So he took that option and went to the bank. And the bank gave him a guarantee that will give you money to buy the property. Mm. Then he took that and did all the plans for the development. Mm-hmm. Right? Finished everything. Then he went and sold an idea to, the, to a pension fund. And they bought into that particular idea. Mm. Went back to the bank and said, now I need $600 million to develop this thing. I've got a letter from the pension fund that mm. says they are on board if I finish and build this mm. thing. Right? So that for me, it was high scale. Very, very high Very scale. high scale at mm. the time. But I was thinking, I can take that mm. and bring it to a lower scale. Mm. If I need to build a room, mm. can I get the plans approved and convince my brother, my sister? So this one time, I wanted mm. to build units, 15 units. 15 units. In Tembisa, right? It's yes. a township. Yes, I know Tembis. You know Tembis. Mm. So I bought this property from this lady f- from our church. She mm. had it on the market for six fifty, and I said to her, "I'll give you the full offer for the property, provided you will borrow me some money to do the development as well." And the bank valued they call that it seller financing. Yes. Mm. So the bank valued that property at, uh, I think it was six hundred. So. Now they were saying they won't finance the rest of the money mm. because the property, the value is not what the property is on the market for. Mm. I said to her, I'll give you full full offer anyway. I'll put in the deposit from my side. Yeah. After that deal was done, the lady loaned me 250000 as part of my development towards the project. Mm. Now, another friend, her mother, loaned me the other 250000 Based on plans. Mm-hmm. So I took what I had learned from my mentor to say... You applied it at a smaller scale. I applied it as, at a and smaller these scale. These people are charging you interest? Or what is yeah, of course. For them? Of yeah, course. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I paid them over a period of four years monthly cash flow. Yes, yes. From the rentals. Mm. But remember now, I'm not the one paying. No. Because the tenants. tenants are paying. Yeah. I'm collecting the rentals. I'm managing the building. I'm managing mm. the property. And then I'm repaying yeah. these people from the so proceeds. So this was a how many unit development? 15. 15. In total. Yeah. This is great. Right. So for me, I realized I don't necessarily have to come from a rich family mm. or have the money mm. to do a development. I just need to have the so right kind of... So what works is the deal. The deal, how you put it together. Yes. Yeah. What works is how you structure Mm. the deal because mm. what a lot of people are thinking of that's why the book is called it's more than just mine mm. you know what i've just said i didn't say mr Mukhobe, i had this some millions mm. saved up to do the development no mm. i said i had a way of doing things mm. there was a thinking behind it i learned oh you did it at a high scale i took the very same thinking applied it in a small scale mm-hmm. did the plans Went back to someone who was selling me a house and said, mm. don't you want to be part of this? Div- this is what your house is going to look like. Yeah. This is what your <laughs> land is now going to look like. Do you want to be part of it? you're selling the dream. I sold the dream. Mm. And that's what business is. Mm. You, you, We are sitting in this building right now. I'm sure before you developed it, there was a dream that was sold to someone and they bought into yes. the dream. Yeah, and they were like, okay, we'll give you the funding mm. provided you deliver on these deliverables that we are giving you. True. We want ROI of X amount. Mm. We want you to pay us back within these terms, mm. within these years. Yeah, yeah, so it was the yeah. same thing to say, it might look like it's an informal market mm. where you're operating. But if you, be, if you professionalize it mm-hmm. and bring the mindset of, this is how much it's going to cost me to do this. This is how much I need from you. Mm. This is how long it's going to take me to finish the development. This is how much I'm going to pay you over a period. This is yeah. how much cash flow you're going to get. Yeah. This is your ROI. So you demonstrate to them. Yeah, but let's talk about scalability. Yeah. Because clearly for you to have the number of doors, I don't know if I'm at liberty to tell the people how many doors you have. No, no, no. We don't tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the reason, you know why? Mm. You and I can talk freely and say it's yeah, yeah, X yeah. amount of doors. Mm. But I think as entrepreneurs... Doors means units for units, those who don't know. As, yeah, as yeah. business people and entrepreneurs, we also have the responsibility of 
giving people knowledge to do something without necessarily telling them exactly what we own. Mm. Because sometimes it's like people look at what you own more than what you're actually demonstrating for yes, them to do. Yes, and they, that's what we're getting wrong. Yeah. We look at you now, we're looking at your results, mm. but we're not hearing the story behind those results. And we're not even listening. We're not listening follow, because yeah. we're focusing on, on but you own a building. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You own how many buildings? <laughs> it's now about the buildings more than true, about the process. True, true. So for me, the biggest thing is if someone can catch the process, mm. That would be... That's much the, more important. Because it's a lot it. easier, I mean, to check how many... Although it's not really easy in South Africa, mm. some things are in trusts. Yeah, yeah. Some companies are owned through trusts. Mm. The main thing is that can we go back and look at the results mm. and find them? Mm. If they're there, then it's fine. Which is which is the question I was going to ask you on scalability. Because yeah. property is, is, a, is a subject that just turns me on. Property is my bread and butter. For sure. So... I'm picking your brain here to find out how you achieved scalability. Mm. What can you share with, with the audience on that? Partnership. Mm. So I think for a lot of people, like what a lot of people that I've been exposed to, including my grandmother, it's for them it's more about paying cash for stuff mm. and not owing anybody. And that's okay and it's okay to a certain extent. But if you want to grow and grow bigger and it all based on risk appetite right you need to also be willing to use some form of leverage to scale Mm -hmm. right and and leverage to scale not only speaks to the debt that you are making it also speaks to the partnerships Mm. that you are making you know there are certain uh deals or buildings that i have interest in where i was not the developer primarily Mm -hmm. someone came and said i'm developing this thing what can be your contribution? And I said, okay, I've made some money from that deal. I'll put it there quietly. Mm-hmm. I know that from that particular one, certain doors belong to me. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain amount of money I'm making mm-hmm. as you do your development. So for me, the biggest thing is partnerships. So instead of focusing on only 100% of the deal, yeah, you, you're happy to own maybe 20, 30%. Yes. As long as the numbers make sense. Yes. I, I, I lost the deal one time. Because I wanted 70% of a deal that I was not financing. Mm -hmm. And I was stuck on, but it's my idea. It became an ego thing. Yeah, it became an ego thing because it was like, but guys, I came up with this thing. Mm. And the other guy is like, but I'm funding 100% of this thing. Mm. If I lose money, you don't lose anything, but you want 70%. So I've learned to understand. He was counter-offering what, 50? He was counter-offering 50-50. Mm. Which was very reasonable. It was very reasonable. But yeah. my young self at the time yeah. didn't understand that yeah. sometimes you've got to be willing to allow other people to have a good share of the project. Mm-hmm. Right? And and even if for now, like if I look at the deal, even if you had said thirty percent, it still would have made sense. It's better than not doing the deal at all yeah. because the deal did not happen. Yeah. You understand? So he had enough leverage mm-hmm. and I didn't even recognize mm-hmm. that but he's got more leverage than me in this thing. Why do you think your younger self couldn't see that? What was the limitation? I think the limitation was lack of exposure and knowledge at the time. Mm-hmm. And and also not having a long term vision. Mm-hmm. Like now if I like now I'll say the the biggest ability to scale anything is being able to have the right kind of partnerships. Mm-hmm. I could have also recognized them as a proper financier and partner in the long term, mm-hmm. right? Because the, the guy was a developer as well. Yeah. So which means any form of upscale and developments that he'll be doing moving forward. Yeah. Because I'm his partner, I, I get to know about them before he starts to wow. do them. Wow. So yeah, I see your point. You understand? Mm. So before he does something, would have said, do you want to be part of it? Mm. And that's my opportunity now to grow. Even if I didn't have the money, remember I said it's more than just money. Mm. I can put together a nice deal and go sell the dream to somebody else. Mm. And in the deal, I don't even have to have 90 or 40%. I can even say, for my expertise of putting this deal together, I'll take 10%. You guys can do 45, 45. Mm. I'm good with my 10. Yeah, yeah. You understand? That and that allows sense. me to have uh, mm. more foot in different kinds of doors. Mm. But it took, it took losing something for me to understand that yeah. now. Ram Daga, you are you are much more passionate about broader idea of entrepreneurship, not just limited to property. Mm. Share a little bit on that. What what excites you about entrepreneurship, and how did it all start? Yeah. Mm. 
So, <laughs> so I, I I was raised by women. Yeah. Right. Uh, my mother was a single parent, but my grandmother, uh, who used to work for the city of Joburg as a cleaner, um, was making about fifteen. Or as a cleaner, was not making much, but she had a shabin. And she was also selling fruits and vegetables. So she was doing all, lo- all sorts of entrepreneurial stuff. Was making about 15,000 rands in the 90s mm. from her business activities, mm. right? And that money was more than what my mother was making, who had a more prestigious job mm. as a nurse. Mm-hmm. So if my grandmother walked in and my mother walked in, respect would be allocated to my mother because <laughs> she's wearing the nursing epilepsy. Yes, yes, right? yes. But my grandmother was actually making more money. In fact, my grandmother at some point was the one even paying our school fees mm-hmm. because she had more money than my mother. Yes. But she didn't have the sophistication because she did not have the degree. Mm-hmm. So for me, observing all of that to say, but the person that has more money between these people, <laughs> as, as a child, it shapes your thinking. Yeah, yeah. Right? To say, this is the person that has more money. Mm. Shab, shab. But she doesn't speak the English. Mm. She doesn't. She didn't even know how to write, mm. let alone know how to speak English. Mm. But she knew how to handle more money than mm. my mother, mm. right? So that spoke to me as a kid and as a child. I remember when I finished varsity, before I went on to work for the marketing company, mm. I wanted to start a laundromat. Yes, because the entrepreneurial side of me yes. wanted to leave school and become an entrepreneur. Mm. My mother was a nurse, right? Mm, mm. So the hospital was not too far from home. Mm. And she said to me, I hear you don't want to get a job. You know, I've been paying school fees for so many years. Mm. You've been using my money and saying you went to school. Mm. I want you to get a job. And I said, nah, no ways. I'm not getting a job. Mm. I'm getting into business. Mm. She's like, okay, what's your business plan? And I said to her, I'm starting a laundromat. The hospital is going to be my client. Mm. Now she's like, the hospital is going to be what? I'm like, the hospital is my client. She's like, you're going to take sheets mm. from the hospital. And bring it to my yard. Mm. That's not going to happen. Because to her, she's thinking, oh, I get when people are the sick, blood, the they disease. mess up yeah, on yeah, themselves. Yeah. She's like, she's spoken, she told me, which meant yeah. you're taking the feces from the hospital yeah. to my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they set up a meeting with my grandma. Yeah. My mother and my grandmother. My grandmother was in Alexander. Mm. We went to sit with my grand. And she said something so profound to me. Mm. She said, we're not saying you shouldn't be in business. But as your grandmother, this is my take. I want you to go get a job so that you could learn how to run a business at somebody else's expense. Mm-hmm. So I want you during the break times to sit down and think about the business that you really want to start. Because this one of mm-hmm. washing sheets <laughs> yeah. is not the one for me. And yeah. I took their advice. Mm-hmm. And I think they helped me a great deal mm-hmm. because those Jewish guys demonstrated to me how to really be an entrepreneur. The Jewish guys that you got a job of. The Jewish guys that I worked for. Mm. To this day, the CEO is still my friend. Yeah, I can call him, I can chat to him because I think it was a moment of being able to now build relationships Mm. in the corporate world. Wow! And she said to me, don't even go for a big company. Mm. Go work for an entrepreneur because that's what you want to do. Now, like I said, my grandmother didn't go to school. But I felt that that sort of wisdom mm-hmm. is the wisdom of age. And she's saying, go learn. Yeah. She's more on learn from another person rather than, obviously, she didn't advocate for school much. She had never been to school. Although she would say, mm. go to school so that you can get a job. So any, any note, noteworthy learnings from, uh, from your Jewish uh, bosses? Because I know that there's always tons of wisdom from, yeah. from the... From, the Jewish community. For sure. So this this one time I had just gotten my degree. I went to graduate. Mm. So I came excited. Mm. I'm like, Chief, boss, I've, I've graduated. Mm. And, and, and he said to me, it's good that you've graduated, but put away everything you've learned in varsity. We will teach you the real stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and for me, what he was basically saying to me is that the learning is in the doing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's what I took with me. The learning is in the active doing. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to read about property development, but it's another to now get bent because you hired the wrong contract. Mm -hmm. It's another to mismanage the project and it's not finished. Mm. And you are seeing the real lesson Mm. of property development rather than just reading about it in a book. Those two things are not the same. Totally different. So for me, I I think the lesson I took from them to this day is if you want to do something, 
get into it and do it. Mm. And then you can retract and do the academic part of it while learning the practical part of doing things. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that that's one of the biggest lessons wow. for me there. Mm. And of course, they did they did show you a little bit about how they handle money. Yeah, of I think course. They're very strict. Yeah, those guys. I mean, that guy to this day, he still drives that Volvo that he bought in 2011. Mm. You know, when I worked for him, the Volvo was two years. I met him recently, still driving the Volvo. Mm. And I'm like, dude, you are richer than me. You are richer than most people I know. Mm. But you, you kept to this car. Mm. And he says to me, um, my biggest focus is growing my business, not growing my lifestyle purchases. Mm. And, and, and that to me as a black person, it speaks to us mm. because I mean, you know how it is, man. We, mm. we, 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 we come from we, trauma. We come from lack. Yeah. So when we get something, we, we feel like we need to demonstrate that, no, 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 I'm no longer that kid that lacks. Mm. I've, got a, I've got a BMW now. Mm. I've got this. I've got that. Mm. So being able to keep to themselves and understanding who they are and mm. understanding the mission mm. is their biggest win. And why do you think we're so obsessed with labels as well as, uh, as African people? You know why? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because... You look at, for instance, uh, colonization and apartheid, for instance, in South Africa. In the apartheid era, you were not allow allowed to own a house in South Africa, right? Mm. So, because you, are not, you didn't own it, it belonged to the government, you can't extend it and make it big. Mm -hmm. So, you are limited. You can only change windows, mm. right? So, what is the next big thing that can give you pride? Mm -hmm. clothes mm -hmm. right now i must buy that expensive shoe because i must show that pella i'm richer than muhu because mm -hmm. my house and his are the same yeah yeah but when yeah. we walk on the streets i must look from flam flamboyant mm. my car must be nicer and that i think has been passed on from generation mm. to generation well, that's how it started people who have never owned land and owned assets mm. feel the need to demonstrate that but i own a gucci mm. i own this because there's a sense of pride in us looking a certain way now yeah that could be but, true but we need to retract and say yeah but you're good enough as as an individual as an academic as mm. a business person in and of yourself before we even talk about your academics are you comfortable in your own skin are you comfortable in who you are mm, mm. right so that now when you start that business it's no longer about demonstrating to the next person that you're doing well. It's more about the mission wow. and the vision. Wow, wow, All right. I want us to talk about the book. And first, I want us to talk about the title. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this title didn't just fall from the sky. It, yeah. it has, it's loaded with meaning. It's more than just money. Sure. Let's talk about the title before we, uh, we talk about the, what the book seeks to, seeks to accomplish. Yeah. So the the title it's more than just money. So it it was COVID, right? Early twenty twenty. Mm. So we no longer we're not allowed to go anywhere. So I decide mm. uh, I'm not going to the office. Let me write. I was mm. just writing on Facebook. Mm. Uh, it was a form of therapy for mm. me. Yeah. But I was writing. I thought let me write about things that are going to inspire people. So I started writing my journey on Facebook, mm -hmm. and a lot of people started to follow me when I started writing. In 2020, I had about 400 followers in mm -hmm. April 2020. 15 days after that, mid, uh, mid no, it was March when I started. Mid-April, I had about 7,000 followers. Then I thought to myself, hey, I, I can't have so many people just following <laughs> me for the sake of following me. Let me write a book. Mm. Because they were asking me questions and my writings were responding to their questions. Mm. But the most prevalent of the questions was about money all the time. Mm. How do I make money? How do I make money? How do I make money? Then I thought to myself, guys, it's actually, it's more than just money. It's mm. not the money mm -hmm. that makes you achieve these things. Mm. There's a certain sort of mindset you need to have to build a business. There's a certain sort of relationship building capacity you need to have. You need to relate people and relate with them well. Rich and poor. You know, some people meet a wealthy person and they relate with them on the basis of what can I get from this guy? Mm -hmm. And they never actually ever get anything from the guy because the guy can pick up that you are not here for the right motives. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing any value. And they won't share much with you. Yeah? They won't share much with you because mm -hmm. you're not bringing any value to mm -hmm. the table. Mm -hmm. You know, and I focused on that to say, build value within yourself. What's your significance? Mm -hmm. What sort of significance can you bring to the table? Can you bring your authentic self to the building 
or to the table and we can see you for who you are and what you bring to the table. What skills do you have? Before you even talk about money, do you have some form of skill that can mm. benefit me? Mm. Mm. If I'm going to take my money and give it to you, what mm. would be the reason? Mm. So then the social media following grew and I felt the need to say, okay, let me write a book. Mm. And Because I saw some ridiculous number, by well over 100,000. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I thought... It really exploded. It exploded from 2020 to 2023. I mean, mm. I had never been on TV. The mm. first day, first time I was on TV was this year. Mm. I had never been on TV. I had never been on radio. And I decided that also I'm going to publish the book in an unconventional way. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to self-publish. Mm. And then I'm going to build like a movement around the book. But let it be, it's more than just money. Mm. Why is it more than just money? The focus should be on the cornerstones of wealth creation business property shares you get money because you bring value to the table like you get rent mm. because you built a, bus- a, a building you get money because you, you have a customer that mm. you're servicing even if you are just working for the government there's mm-hmm. certain service that you are providing for mm. them to give you the money so that's that's what the focus was on and mm. for for people to understand that there's a certain sort of mindset as well mm. Mm. that needs to be applied so sometimes it seems as if people need more than a mindset change. It's almost like they need a brain transplant because, <laughs> of, because of the, 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 the difference yeah. in, in outlook between somebody who's poor, and here I'm talking about poor mindset, sure. and wealthy, and I'm talking wealthy mindset. I'm not talking goods yeah. and services. And I get the impression after reading your book that if this is something that you're really, really concerned about, and you're trying to break through or yeah. communicate to people. Do you want to speak a little bit more on that? For sure. You know what I love about the, your question mm. and, and talking about the mindset between a rich person and a poor person. I was born in a village, remember? I grew up in a township. Mm. I've, I've, I live in suburbs, mm. right? I've developed properties in certain areas, townships, suburbs, everywhere. Mm. So I'm, I'm multifaceted when it comes to an African person, right? Mm. I, I know the struggles of someone who's in the village. I know the struggles of someone in the township. And I understand the mindset of some of the people then the suburbs because I live with them. Mm. What is prevalent is that someone could come from the poorest of poorest of areas. But if his mindset is correct and is exposed to the right people, he always find, money always finds a way to locate itself to that person Mm -hmm. even if that person decides to continue to stay in the village or in the township Mm -hmm. he always finds a way to make money and you could take someone even who grew up in a rich family if he doesn't have a mindset of service a mindset of putting other people first because for you to risk your family legacy and say i'm building a building you are taking the money you've worked for for how many years and you're putting Not it in a life, building, yeah. right? Mm. What are you do? People don't understand that. Mm. Some of them would look at it and say, he's greedy. Why does he want more? Mm. But you are surveying because that building is not like you're going to live in 400 rooms. No. You need one room yeah, to live in. That's true. Right? Mm. The other 399 are literally you serving the community. Mm. And that's the mindset of entrepreneurship. The mindset of entrepreneurship is somebody could be working as an administrator in an office, right? Mm. They can say, I earn 5,000 pula. Mm. It's all I'll ever make. Mm. That's all the company is pays. willing to give me. Yeah, but that's not all the company is willing to pay. Mm. It's all the company is willing to pay you because mm. you are not willing to grow in mindset. Mm. Are there no people within the company that earn 10,000 pula? They are. That and 20,000 pool. Mm-hmm. So which means if you transform your thinking and transform your education, mm. you could earn just as much as those people. If not more. Uh, if not more. Mm. And then another mindset of entrepreneurship is I earn 5,000 pool as an, as an administrator. Mm. But that's not all I can make mm. because I can take that 5,000 pool as a seed mm-hmm. for me to be able to invest in other businesses or in property, yes, so that I too could earn multiple strips of income. Wow. You understand? So it's more of a mindset, more mm. than anything for mm. me when I look at it. This is beautiful. And now you're going beyond just yourself as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur going beyond yourself as a property developer. You are creating a movement. For sure. I just want to see what, understand what triggered that, that that's, you know, that, that sort of thinking. 
how did it all start for you to think of it as a movement yeah so so for a country to prosper the citizens must prosper right and 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 here's how i look at it mm. as a property developer if people are poor who's going to rent my units <laughs> only poor people you don't get much you, you don't get much mm. right but if there's a movement of mohobe studying a business Kumo is studying a business. Neo is studying a business. It creates an environment where people have got self-sufficiency because mm. when you start a business, you are hiring 5, 10, 20, 100 mm. people. Mm. When he started, starts a business, he's hiring 5, 10, 20 people. Mm. Those people are getting salaries. Now, it creates a business opportunity. Now, back to me. Mm. I not only have to do property, I can look and say, can I build a technology business mm. and charge these people certain... Uh, money for the services that I provide to mm, them, mm, right? Mm. It creates an environment where now it's easy for more people to start businesses because there are people that afford their services. Mm. So the movement is mainly to defend the, for instance, I'm in South Africa, the South African economy, mm. right? To say, why should black people be at the mercy of the government? Why, why should we always be begging? So mm. there's a pan-Africanist side of me that says, it pains me to be begging all the time, mm. right? Why is it that Black it's people, embarrassing. it's embarrassing, mm. you know, that you have kids, right? Mm, mm. Where your kids are leaving your community to go work in somebody else's community. Mm. Whereas you could build a business which you've done and your kids can work in your own business. Yeah, that's they are working. that's wow. not that's <laughs> not even nepotism. Mm. That's called generational legacy. Mm. And I wanted the generational legacy not, not only to me to be limited to me and my family but also to transform an entire nation. And I'm looking at the next 20, 30 years to say what, what I've started, no matter how small, even if it impacted one person, right? And, and in 20 years' time, mm. I want to say this on record, mm. when, when I buy my daughter a Bentley yeah. f- as a wedding present, mm. for instance, mm. I don't want somebody else's daughter to be jealous of my daughter mm-hmm. because he's in a capacity, he's got capacity as well to do the same mm. for his own daughter. Wow. And those are the kind of things that eliminate poverty in a, uh, in a country. Mm. And when we eliminate poverty, we're also in eliminating things that come with poverty, mm. crime, mm. sickness, and all of those things. So I have a deep desire, and I think it's more of a calling more mm. than anything, mm. for me to see my people do well. And, and not be a nuisance and, 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 to somebody and there's else. there's a speaking component to this. Mm. Um, you're also a speaker. You talk to audiences. Yeah. And you've come to Botswana to share your wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the speaking career and how you develop that part. The speaking career. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's as if these things accidentally fall, fell on me. You know, the, the property business was like, oh, your mother said manage back rooms mm. and the book you were writing like let me write the book during covid yeah. during covid yeah. and the speaking also is a byproduct of the book because i i thought to myself let me launch a speaking career mm. but i want to be in charge and control it i don't want to wait for someone to call me to come speak mm. I, i'll create my own platforms and my own movement mm. and i'll speak as and when i want to because people are willing to listen to me yeah right when i call an event and people come I'm going to bring value to the table and deliver to those people. And be that as it may, obviously other companies do call me and pay me Mm. for my speaking. But I I want to be able to control the businesses that I'm in, Mm. right? Control is very important. Control is very important as Mm. a businessman. Mm. You know, I don't want to be told, no, don't go on Mohobe's podcast. Mm. No, I want to decide where to Mm. be, how to be on my own terms Mm. because nobody's going to say, if you go there, we're taking away your radio slot. Yeah. No, you mm. want your freedom. I want to be able to say, if I don't have a radio station, I'll create a YouTube channel. Mm. If I don't have a, a platform where I'll go speak, I'll call an event, people will come, mm. I'll speak. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's more of being able to control your work, but also being con- able to control the kind of significance that you have in mm-hmm. society. So I'm, I'm, I didn't look at the speaking more as a career. But I looked at it as as something that's part of me. And at mm-hmm. some point in my younger days, I was a youth pastor. 
oh, a church. Okay. You know, so which meant I spoke a lot <laughs> on a podium. Yes. And I could have done it for free. Yes. You know, but the businessman in me right now says, but mm. the value that you're delivering, mm. um, there's value in what you are saying. Yes. So and you need to impactful. charge for it. It's, yes. it's impactful. Mm. People are buying properties. People are starting businesses. They're coming with testimonies. Mm. And, and I can't wait to see, like I'm saying, in the next 20 years, what sort of society you're going to be having wow. in South Africa and hopefully in Africa as well. Because yeah. I want to see, I really want to see black people also realizing that they're also God's children. Yeah, you know? yeah. They're 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 no, I've never any, had any doubt in my mind, but yes, I know why you have to say that. Mm. Now, the purpose of your trip to BW, to Botswana, Botswana. what are you intending to accomplish and what have you done so far? What are the plans oh, for BW? Yeah. Uh, I I enjoyed uh, my stay in Botswana. Uh, it's like a it's like a second South Africa. It's yeah, a mini yeah. South Africa in a way. It feels like home. Yeah. Uh, but I was here on business. Um uh, one of our other businesses that we involved in which is not in the property industry. Mm -hmm. So I was here just to um, to spy the land mm -hmm. and see what sort of expansion plans that we can have. Uh, but there's also an element of, I've got a lot of following in Botswana as well. Mm. Uh, and and people are saying what you're doing in South Africa in terms of the tour mm. and the business and property seminars, bring it into Botswana and and bring other big business people in Botswana to come speak on your platforms because we want to be able to transform our society as mm. well. You know, so uh, in October, we'll be having an event. And I want to invite you on on screen mm. and say, please become one of our speakers. There, share your knowledge, share your journey. You heard it here first, folks. I'm saying a big yes. A big I'm yes. very, very excited about being one of the speakers. Yeah, let's have the event, mm. a business and property seminar. Let's encourage the youth to get into business. Let's encourage the youth to build businesses, get into the property industry. You know, I have, uh, I have a fifth cohort now in terms of uh, a mentorship uh, program. For sure. Um, so it's stuff I talk about nonstop. You yes. Know, what I've also found is that when you learn and internalize this thing about property and you, you see how much you can impact others, mm -hmm. you don't want to keep it to yourself. You want sure. to share. So For sure. That is my mindset. So the answer is yes. Can you give us more details? When is it uh, exactly? And uh, what can people expect? Okay, we're looking at a date of the 21st of October. Right? Uh, and then on the day, what people need to be expecting is just uh, knowledge around entrepreneurship. How you can start. Um, mm. Even if you're employed, mm. how you can just reinvest what you're earning into a business. Mm. Uh, reinvest it into the property industry how to start your own property investment portfolio. It doesn't have, the scale does not have to be mm. at a high, start where you mm. are. Mm. Being able to use your resources at the level where you are to start your journey exactly where it is and grow from there. Mm. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to also, it's an environment where also young professionals and business people can network and come together. You know, from architects to engineers people in the mining industry, people mm -hmm. in the oil industry, people in different kinds of PR companies, yeah. marketing. Let's come together and let's see what sort of businesses can we start. What other areas in Botswana can be developed? Is Khabroni supposed to be the only developed mm, city in the country? Be. Why should it be? Yeah. Why aren't we developing other areas? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we making them an exact replica and mirror of Khabroni? And mm. even better, Mm. That job is not going to be done by the government alone. Let's no, forget no, that. No. Let it be you and I as entrepreneurs saying, we love our country. We are going to develop it and make it a better place. Wow. Wow. You know? I like the sound of that. It makes perfect sense. Now, I want us to go to the book. I'm going to actually play a game with you. A game? Uh, yes. I'm going <laughs> to be opening pages at random. Mm -hmm. And I really want to see if you are the true author of this book. <laughs> yes. And then, you want to make sure nobody wrote it for me, a ghostwriter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At random on page 63. Yeah. Being able to refinance using your property as a bank. For sure. Tell us how you can use your property as a bank. All right. So refinancing, a refinancing structure is when you've, you've bought a property, you've put in some value into the property. Maybe the property has grown in value over time. 
Uh, maybe you bought it for 600,000 pula. It's now worth 700,000 pula, for instance. And then that means you now have 100,000 rands equity mm-hmm. in the property, right? Mm-hmm. And you can go to the bank and say to the bank, I want to get that money out of my property. You refinance it. Mm-hmm. And, and they loan you that money Some against... Some call it equity release. Equity release, yes. Mm-hmm. You release equity out of out of the property. They give you the 100,000 mm-hmm. and the, they, they load that onto your current bond on that property and you pay it back over a period of time. The mm-hmm. nice thing about refinancing is that it's not taxed because mm-hmm. uh, you can't tax me on a debt. No. Even can't. when I sell the property later, you can't say, but last year you borrowed money. Mm-hmm. No, I've used the money for other things mm-hmm. And that structure is what uh, wealthy people do. They build a property, they put value into it, and they go back and say, it's grown in value, mm. I want to get my money out. That's you what get makes the money out so beautiful. And reinvest that money into mm. other projects mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then another page, hiring people and building systems under the topic of teach your income to live, to without, live without you. How yeah. do you teach money or income to live without you? Yeah. The, the, the reason why a lot of people are enslaved is because they only make money when they're there, even as business people. There mm. are business people that's, that can, can come and sit on a podcast mm. because if I come here, it means the shop is closed. But if I've built systems around my business for me to be able to manage uh, and track what's going on yeah. and hire people... In other words, creating passive income streams. Yes, mm. but... You know, most of the time when you talk about passive income streams, people only think about property. Mm -hmm. But if you build systems within an existing business and hire people to do things that you would have done if you were there, then you've put systems in place. Mm -hmm. If you're able to manage those people and look after, work on the business instead of in the business, then then you've released your time. Mm. Then you are teaching the income to live without you. I don't readily accept, I understand that. Working on the business instead of in the business. Yeah. Can you explain it simplistically? Some yeah. people may not know the difference. Working in the, in the business means the money will only go in if I'm there. Mm. I, I have to be there. Mm. And, and, and sometimes it's this deep need for control. Mm. Right? And then working on the business is being able to say, I've started it. I've put some systems in place. I've hired some people to do certain things. Mm. Like you, you, you don't have to be running to do maintenance now. No. You can hire a maintenance per se. Actually, you don't know how to do it. You understand? <laughs> and you don't have to. That's yeah. what people don't get. Mm. You don't have to know mm. how to do maintenance mm. because you hire your weaknesses. Mm-hmm. That's what people don't understand. Mm. You don't hire your strengths. You already know how to find a deal. Mm. You already know how to put a team together to develop. But your weakness might be I can't do maintenance. Then you hire that skill to do the maintenance for you. Mm. That means you don't necessarily have to run there to do the maintenance. Yeah. You are teaching your income that even if I'm not there, the job continues. And which means I continue to make money. Absolutely. It makes sense. You also talk about the importance of taking life insurance. Yeah. Um, are you getting a commission? From these insurance companies. I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, I, I wish, you know, sometimes uh, with the number of people that have come to me and said, I've now set up a, a trust. Mm. Uh, I've taken up a life insurance and I'm going to give the money to my trust mm. when I die. My trust is going to have, there's a will that dictates how my trust is going to run and mm. operate mm. and how my descendants mm. also must take up life insurance and pay to the same trust so that generational wealth can continue. That is for people that don't, ha- don't have the entrepreneurial skills that you and I have. Mm. But they can use life insurance to now build generational wealth for themselves. Should the person pass, mm. he might not have left a building, he might not have left uh, a big business, Mm. But there's the life insurance payout that goes to the trust. Mm-hmm. The trust, there's information on how the trust can operate and service obviously the next people, generation. Obviously, people need to get the book to understand. To understand exactly what I'm detail. saying. Yeah. Right? So, because when you say f- trust, and I know that there's a sizable percentage who don't know what a trust, a trust is. or a family And they trust think is. a trust is a trust fund. Mm. And those things in are not lawyer, the same. In a lawyer's <laughs> trust account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So maybe we should keep them hanging there so they can buy the book. For sure. Let me adjust to another little um, issue which you've already touched on indirectly. You said nine ways to find a mentor. Can you teach them a few ways that a mentor can be found? So if I wanted you to be my mentor, 
Mm-hmm. I, w- I would put myself in a position where I must serve. Uh, the first one, I would write to you and, and, and offer to take you to dinner, no matter how expensive the dinner is. And I pay for the dinner. Because in that dinner, I then get to ask certain questions. Things that you took you 25 years to do. Mm, I'm, to going to, yeah. I'm going to get in 15 minutes mm. if I write, ask the right kind of questions. Mm. Because the quality of my questions are going to determine the quality of your answers to what's Especially if you come prepare. If I come prepare, mm. you know. Mentors are looking for people to mentor. But they don't want to waste their time on somebody who doesn't know what they want. Mm. Right? So I need to know what I want. Mm. And also, um, reading a book that has been written. I know you've got a book coming up, for instance. Yes, yes. I, people need to read your book. They don't understand that. You, they don't have to sit with you like this for you to mentor them. Mm. Them watching this, this podcast, they're getting mentored by you. Mm. Them reading your book, they're getting mentored by you. Them following you on all different social media platforms where mm. you're sharing your nuggets and your views, mm. they're getting mentored by you. Let's mm. quit the traditional way of thinking mm. about things. Mm. Mm. You know, and, and one of the things you get a mentor, you ask. Mm. You know, people are scared to ask, can you please be my mentor? Mm. And of course, you might not agree to mentor them, but perhaps maybe you can grant them an interview. Mm. You know, I've, I've been in spaces where I'd ask for an interview. I would say, even if you give me 15 minutes of your time, say, when the guy's like, oh, a young entrepreneur wants to learn, come, I'll, mm. I'll give you 15. The 15 minutes, if I come prepared, ends up you being do. an hour. Absolutely. You know, you spoke for, to me yeah. for five minutes and you said, I like this guy. Yeah. Now we're sitting for we how long now? Yeah, yeah. It's an hour and a half. It's going to be. Um, 10% goes towards giving arms. I think here you can teach us a little bit of, of this, yeah. this thinking. What is giving alms? Alms spelled A-L-M-S. Yeah, charity. Mm-hmm. You know, charity, it could be charity, it could be tithe, if those those who go to church. I mean, depending on the mission of your church, I'm not saying give money to churches. Mm. I'm just saying give money to good causes. Because the most selfish thing you can do is give. You know, if, if you've got resources. Say right? that again. The most selfish thing you can do is give. That's counterintuitive, but it's true. The feeling that it gives you to see a young kid that that is in a child-headed family and because of your giving, not publicly, just what it does to you, mm. because of your giving, now that child is a doctor because you contributed something in his schooling career. Mm. It does something to you. Because of your giving, that child is able to go to bed full and not hungry because you decided it doesn't even have to be a lot of money is this 10 percent like the tithing that they speak about in church yeah it is it is similar to tithing mm. you know and like i'm saying tithing does not necessarily mean giving to church mm. identifying those families you can look after mm. not for, for not for media or public uh, relations related purposes mm. just for you to know i've got those kids they're my kids because you know why you are eradicating some of society's biggest problems. When that young kid knows that uh, Mr. Mokhobe Manthen is coming and is bringing groceries, there's no need for him to go steal. Mm. Now he can focus on the books. Mm. Now his mindset is different. Settled. His relationship Come. with society, mm. even if his father or mother abandoned him, he says, but I have a father in that man who brings me groceries. Mm. So there's an element of love to it. So his relationship with society cannot be that mm. of trying to hurt society. Mm. Now it becomes that of saying, I too can be a person of value and start adding value mm. in society. So there's a long-term effect for, because the black society has been hurt so much and, and we need to bring in elements within ourselves and built in systems where mm. we can start healing society yes. in different ways. That's good. I love that one. Um, are you... Are you... Are you of the mindset of Donald Trump who says that a man who marries a woman mm-hmm. without an antenuptial contract is like a, a man who lives a, a house without windows? Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, a, like, it's like a city broken down without walls. Yes. You know, and, and what I mean by that is that, I mean, I've been married before. You know, mm-hmm. I got divorced two years ago. 
Oh, and sorry. what made the <laughs> thank you for that he's laughing one of the audiences are laughing yeah yeah and and what make it what made it easy for the both of us was mm. because there was a prenup and there was an understanding so there was no need to drag a fight mm. right because everything was yes, discussed out. Before we even got married, mm-hmm. um, that should there be an inst- incidence of a divorce? God forbid. God forbid. Mm. How do we manage our assets, and how do we do it fairly? Right. It's not what's fair is what's written. Mm. It's not feelings. Fairness is not a feeling. Mm. You know that's what people don't understand. And sometimes you're not getting a prenup because you're protecting yourself against divorce. No. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're getting Sometimes a, a you prenup. Sometimes you get advice from the aunties and the uncles. They say, no, we don't do that. That's, yeah. That is but you true. need to protect your family because yeah. you're a businessman. True. Right? If 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 you your business gets liquidated and you're in some sort of financial trouble, God forbid, mm. it shouldn't be affecting your spouse mm-hmm. who's now working as a nurse or a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. Right? If the house is in his name, mm. all hell could be breaking loose around you but you get to sleep mm. at home nicely yeah, yeah. and have a home cooked meal because you've got a prenup that says not everything that you own belongs to her and mm. vice versa. Mm. You come to me, you want to get something from me. I'm like, this house is not mine. It's my wife's house. Mm. Here's the documentation. Here's the documentation. Mm. So I get to have a roof over my head and continue mm. to think about how do I get out of this mess? Mm. But you see, if we're married in common... So in your case, it really helped to have this uh, watertight... A- Antinatural contract. I believe in it. I believe in it wholeheartedly because it protects the family. Mm-hmm. Divorce aside, we're not doing it because of divorce. We're doing it because let's protect the family, mm. right? If if God forbid I sign some deal that is now costing me everything I have, it doesn't have to cost me everything my wife has. Mm. And maybe in some ways, some of the things you're buying, mm. you are saying, baby, let's set up this business in in, in your name. Mm. You run this business. Mm. You are able to separate. It's asset protection. True, true. true. Asset yeah. protection is part of wealth creation. Mm. You know. And why do you think a lot of our people don't seem to grasp that simple concept? Because they think they've been taught by, by, by even church mm. that it's wrong to get married out of community of property. But they don't understand that there's something called accrual. Mm. whatever you build together you own together mm. there's systems and ways in which you structure these things mm. and I, I can say it's a lack of knowledge because mm. even when I wanted to get married a lot of people spoke against it but now that I, I look back and say but you see now there was an unfortunate incident of a divorce mm. we could have been dragging and still fighting for a dog Make, even today making the lawyers rich yeah, you know, you're a lawyer. You know, the lawyers get rich in a fight called divorce. The lawyers are the ones that get rich. And, yeah. and, and I thank God also because although there was squabble, there was, squabble, mm. there was structure mm. in the squabbles, you know. And, and my ex-wife would say as well, yeah. look, you've built these businesses. All right. I've been there. Give me what's due to me, which we both know. And I'll give you what's due to you mm. with we both so it was, there was understanding because there's something written, yeah. the structure. And it's very important for business people to appreciate that. Yeah. Because I endorse those views 100%. For sure. One thing that you talk about in your book is the importance of courage and having courage. Yeah. I want to use yourself as an example yeah. where you applied courage and how it made a difference. You, you know, it, it, it takes courage to be different because people like me can be easily misunderstood. You know, some of the things I'm saying here, I could, could, I could easily be misunderstood. But it takes courage for me to sit here and, and articulate and express myself mm. the way I want to. Because mm. I know that people are looking, they, they, they'll bring judgment. Yes. Those who will say stuff. Yeah. But because I'm courageous, I'm saying, let it be. Mm. When I started writing, there were a lot of people that were speaking against me. Mm. But it takes courage to actually say, it doesn't matter what the views of other people are. As long as... I'm confident in the words that I'm speaking and I know it's authentic mm. and it's true. Mm. I'm going to stick to it. You know, to, and, to and courage is something you have to develop. It's, it's, it's not, it it's a muscle. Be, yeah. Tell me about that. It's a muscle because um, it starts with little things mm. where you have to say, no, I don't agree with what you're saying and you don't say it. 
The minute I say I don't agree, Mr. Mukobe, I'm developing my courage muscle. Mm. I've got the courage to speak my views. Yes. Then I will have the courage to launch that business when I want to because mm. I've been developing the muscle over time. If you've been betraying yourself, for instance, you're betraying your confidence, mm. right? You won't have enough confidence to develop some businesses. Mm -hmm. You don't even believe in the words that you are speaking. How can you build a business? Mm. How can you how can you build a building? You can't even stand up to what you believe in or for what you believe in and say, but this these are my thoughts on this mm. thing. So it starts small. Yes. But over time when one develops it, it's like confidence, mm. right? Confidence, we are not born confident. I wasn't born I wasn't born speaking like this. Mm. I practiced over the years and I learned to be confident you, in the smaller things I, first. And also you were comfortable with discomfort in other words you made yourself uncomfortable originally yeah yeah i, I think that's a part that i, I, I love find it has, to well. be, has to be taught you know? yeah mm. yeah so I, I you are right i love what you're saying because in most of the time even in business you, you are uncomfortable in the growth phases mm. the minute you're comfortable you know it seems like i'm not growing mm. why is this thing so easy let's find a way to do something bigger and yeah. challenge ourselves it's constantly a space where you are being challenged. Um, you are challenging yourself. It's Guys, this is the book. This is the book. Please. I could go further, but I don't want to spoil it for you. Please find a way of, of getting hold of the book. And I'm sure at the end you'll give uh, details of where it can be found in Botswana. Absolutely. And in Sanzi, wherever the audience is. Yes. All right. Um, let's talk about Zaga. Where Man. is the Zaga? Okay. I mean, people are looking at us. We're talking. We look. But they are scratching their heads. But where is the money? Where are these guys? Where is the money? How do we make the money? And and of course, you said in the book that it's not all about money, but money plays an important role. Yeah. Where is it, and how do you get a hold of it? The money is in your gift. Yeah. You've got all sorts of people in this room right now. The cameraman is making money. Uh, the videographer is making money. Mm. Why? It's their gift. There's something you cannot do yourself. So you have to go out and hire their gift mm. for them to make money so that you can look good on camera. Right? So if you're a young person, like now, someone would say, but Muslim Mukhobe is doing property, but he's got a gift. And, and that gift is called the gift of management. Mm. You looked within yourself and say, what is it that I'm good at? I'm good at speaking. I'm good at negotiating. Mm. I'm good at managing. Mm. And you thought, I'm going to cut deals. And I'm going to be ruthless in what I do <laughs> and do it well and build these buildings. Mm. It's in your gift. Mm. It's not even about the building. Mm. It's about the gift that you unlocked within yourself. Like now I'm sitting here, I'm speaking, right? Someone could say, but this guy is articulate. I'm articulate because it's my gift. And I've learned to understand that. Mm. So because I know when I walk into any negotiation space, be it a boardroom or anywhere, mm. I know for a fact, I'm aware, I'm self-aware. Mm. My gift is communication. Mm. So if I sit and listen and communicate properly, I'll, I'll walk out with a proper deal. Mm. So I've learned to understand that about myself, mm -hmm. right? So, but somebody somewhere knows how to cook more than I know how to communicate. A and they have to see it for what it is and mm. stop overlooking it and say, I want to be like Mkhub. Mm. I want to be like witness. No, mm. be yourself. Be authentic to who you are. I'm sitting here because I've chosen to be authentic and be myself. I'm going yeah. to use my gift. For instance, I get paid. Mm. Uh, passive income. One yeah. of the things you, you, if you write a book and publish it, mm. you get paid even if I have to even write. if you're not there. How many times do I have to write this? Just once. How many times do I get paid? Limitless. Limitless. You mm. understand that? Mm. But the gift in it is the gift of Communication, it's all the same thing. Mm. Writing is communication. Mm. Speaking is communication. Doing business is communication. It's all communication. That's what people don't understand. So mm. I knew, or I'm, I've, I've, thank God, I've discovered that actually my gift is communication. But mm. what is your gift? You mm. might be sitting at home mm. thinking, I hear this guy speaking. Well, what is your gift? If you hone it down to that, then you build a business around it. Mm. Other skills you develop over time. The mm. soft skills mm. you develop over time. But to you build on your core skills. Yes, because I, I, I have a gift of management yeah. as well, yeah. right? Mm. If I've got a business, I need to manage people. I have to lead people. It means 
there's a gift of leadership mm. embedded in that thing. You know, when you read the Bible, it says we all have different gifts according to the grace that has been given to us. Mm. So people are graced differently. Mm. There are certain things you do better than me. Yes. There are certain things I do better than you. That's why we need each other, right? Where you but are not you strong, I'm strong. What do you think of I'm those strong. who say that develop your passion or discover your passion yeah. and the money will follow? Because I have difficulties with that statement. Yeah, our passion is not going to pay you. Mm. That's what people don't understand. Uh, you might be passionate about coffee, but mm. if you don't know how to run a coffee company, you are in trouble. Mm. It's not passion. You understand? For me, can you hear how passionately I'm speaking? Yes. It means I'm passionate about speaking, right? Mm, mm. But is that where I started? No, you didn't start there. I didn't start there. Yeah. I started by building a business that makes money first. Mm. Then I can demonstrate my passion freely without hindrance. Yes. So that's why I'm able to speak freely because mm. no one is going to say, if you say the stupid thing, mm. you're not getting a salary or you're fired. <laughs> yeah. So you first develop your ability to make money. Wow. And then you can do the things you are passionate about because mm. passions need funding. Mm. Right? Yes. Passions need funding. Mm -hmm. A passion needs to be funded. Indeed. Right? For someone, if my daughter says, Daddy, she's five. Mm. But let's say now she's 15 and whatever. Mm. And she says, I'm passionate about music. You know why it's fine for her? She's got a, a father who's an author and a business person who, who can, can fund that passion. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. passion needs fin funding. Funding, yes. Right? So you don't even have bread to eat. Mm -hmm. But you're following a passion. If your passion is music, mm. here's what I'm saying. This if your, is so crucial. If your saying. passion is music, mm. better make sure it's something you're good at. Because you don't get paid for your passion. You get paid for what you're good at. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. Your passion could be property. But if you're not good at property, you're not going to get paid. Get paid. Yeah, yeah. But if you're good at it, mm. now you've merged your passion mm. with your skills. Mm -hmm. The thing that you're paid for the most is your skills. What skills do you have? What mm. are you bringing to the table? Mm. If I'm paying you, I don't care what your passion is. Mm. Like right now, you don't care whether the guy is passionate about camera or not. You care about whether he can He's do it well. It. Yes, yes. That's the only reason you are paying him. <laughs> yes. The world does not pay you for your passion. No. The no. world pays you for what you're good at. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's that. Yeah. I don't yeah. care what my passion is. Mm. My passion now is speaking. Mm -hmm. But but I've learned to also understand. But I, I'm, a, I'm a good speaker. Yeah. It's not just the passion. Yeah. I speak well and, and I... I don't have to twang. Yeah. I just have to speak in a <laughs> manner that people understand what I'm saying. And in that's fact, it. twanging might turn them off. <laughs> it might turn, turn them. So I have, all I need to do is speak well and deliver the message. Yeah. That's it. Normally. Yes. Normally. Yes. Right? Mm. So for me, it's not even, and it ties into the message, message about Zaga. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that question of passion. Mm. Right? Because, yeah, we don't get paid for no, our passion. This we get is paid so for what I we like the way you've explained it, and I agree 100%. Let's talk now long-term prospects. I mean, here we are. We're in Botswana. Mm -hmm. you, you you said um, you're planning this uh, event in, in 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 October, and the book is coming out. Social media is bubbling. Let's project. If you had a crystal ball and you looked into it, like 10, 15, 20 years, yeah. what are we gonna see um, in terms of your brand as Witness and Daga? And in terms of your, your, you know, even your property business. Yeah. Mm. So my brand as witness, I think it would have now gone. It's already international now. Uh, but I think the, in, the biggest thing is growing the influence. Mm. And the influence in the right way. Influencing communities to build and develop. You know, um, progressive thinking mm. for me. So in the next 20 years, I see more of that brand. Mm. Um, growing in that, you know, mm. being 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 that person of influence. Mm. I'm 34. At 54, even if a president in my country needs to make a decision, I need them to call me first mm. because of the amount of influence that I would have built and had even over them. Mm. So for me, in the next 20 years, as brand witness, is putting myself in a position that I can influence decisions. Mm. and influence them for the right cause for, for humanity, mm -hmm. right? So the business and the working and everything mm -hmm. is mainly going towards that. Mm -hmm. And I think every business person needs to put themselves in a position where they've got proper influence. 
And influence doesn't mean connections. There's a difference between connections and influence. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between having money and having influence. Those two things are not the same. Maybe right? you tell us. A, a person can have money and have zero influence. Right? You are rich, but you don't have influence. Mm-hmm. Nobody listens to you with your money. Mm. And somebody could have less money than you. You see, like Mandela. Mm. Mandela was not a billionaire, but Mandela was influential mm. globally. I agree. You understand? Mm. So for me is, okay, let's match the two. Build the money and the influence. Because then when you have the influence and the money, Mm. your money also is able to fund the things that you want to influence. Yeah, but speaking to the future, tell us physically what we can expect to see. Uh, will there be buildings yeah, all cities. over Africa? Yeah, cities. Yeah, tell us, tell us cities. What, yeah, what your I, vision I think, is. I think for me, uh, my vision is for Africa. Mm. You know, seeing different cities springing up in Africa and, and me playing a key role also mm. in them. Whether it's 10%, like I said, mm. or 90% or mm. 100%. Mm. But I, I, I want to see new cities. Mm. I said to you that even in Botswana, do we want... Khaburoni to remain the shining star mm. or we want other places to also have these cities that mm. imagine Mukhube city yeah. or, or a city that has been built by Witness Mtak mm. even in another country where mm. I wasn't born so for me I look at that and I say even if it's just to influence that mm. I'm happy you know businesses springing up um, and, and growing my companies you know I've got a technology company that we are working on uh, it's a property technology company. We'll speak about it um, mm, when we bring it to Botswana. A little snippet, just a teaser. What, what does it do? So it's to help people manage uh, their property portfolios, mm-hmm. and and also it's like software. It's software it's management. Both, system. Yeah, it's software uh, plus uh, a listing platform. Mm-hmm. Software. It's a measure of software and listing, mm. um, but also making it easy for the every day Tom Dick and Harry to be able to use. Mm-hmm. And if I'm starting in my property development journey or property investing journey, I can tap into the system mm-hmm. and it could help me to mm-hmm. manage my portfolio. We'll invite you guys to come and uh, pitch to us here in our company. Maybe I would love a, that. Yeah, that would yeah, be a nice we'll bring that. We'll bring that into Botswana um, as well. Then on the speaking and the writing, do you have a picture that emerges 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah. So I, I, on the speaking and the writing, I think because I've got a company called QGI Consulting and Publishing. So I not only, that's the company that published uh, yeah. this book, mm-hmm. right? But I want, I want to see more authors springing up from there mm-hmm. as well. You know, I want, I want to see a lot of authors in yeah. the African continent being helped mm. uh, through that business. And then on, on the speaking I want it to be an international thing, mm. you know, globally, which I know in the next 15 to 20 years yeah. it will be, right? But I believe in, in building a base. Yeah. It's like an army, you know? Yeah. An army doesn't go out to want to capture mm. enemy territory without protecting their base. Yeah. My base is South Africa. My base is Africa. And that's where I want to solidify my my speaking career. And then will go capture other bases. Wow. So that's why my tour, mm. I did, I'm doing nine provinces in South Africa. Plus Botswana. Plus Botswana. <laughs> yeah. our, our tenth province. Yeah. Right? So there's Botswana, yeah. there's prospects for Namibia, mm. there's prospects for Lesotho, mm. um, Swaziland, there's prospects as well. So there's conversations mm. around doing these things outside South yeah. Africa. Yeah. But I believe in solidifying your base. You should invite me across also. You're invited. Yeah, yeah. You're invited. It's a deal. You're invited. I will, I will buy yeah. a ticket. And you, come. you need to start also frequenting South Africa. Mm. Uh, like we said, where you will be doing do, deals that it's side. just for business and for, for leisure. Now yeah. I want it for speaking. For speaking. I want you to open another avenue. Absolutely, yes. All right. Now, um, failure is part of success. Yes. A person cannot achieve what you've achieved without significant setbacks yeah. sometimes cataclysmic events for sure. sometimes even uh, you know devastation yeah do you want to share on that aspect of course have you experienced any of that yeah i have mm. i have i mm. have there are projects that i've done that did not get finished mm. for, uh, for lack of a better word mm-hmm. and they took longer than they did and charged more money than they should have really? right and and you look at it and say I was paying school fees. Mm. You know, as as a young, passionate business person, Mm. I I could say 
even uh, the failure of my marriage, mm. you know, it's part of business. What people don't understand, what affects you in your personal life, mm. affects you in your business and sometimes vice versa. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the falling apart of my marriage is me saying, I look back and I say, those are some of the consequences of being a dreamer mm. sometimes, mm. right? Where now one has to look at it and say, perhaps I should have done things maybe differently, mm. right? So those failures, mm. you look back and say, it cost me something. Yeah, yeah. It cost me something to be me. Somebody can look at me now and say, oh, wow, I want to be this guy. But are you willing to go through the pain? Mm. To be me, are you willing? Are you willing to go through the divorce? <laughs> uh, nobody wants to go nobody through. Nobody wants that, right? Yeah, yeah. I've suffered. I mean, the death of my mother. Mm. You know, all, of the, although that doesn't directly come from business failure, yeah. but it's something that one lives with for the rest of their yeah. life. Sh- you understand? I've been there, done that. You've been there as well. You mm. know how it feels. Yeah, yeah. I know for a fact that even at your age, you think about it and say, "Ish, musadi muholo." Mm. I would have loved to see Musadi Mukhulu to see the stuff, some of the things I'm doing now. I would have wanted to see her live long because we we have, you know, grandfather and grandparents and parents live long. So how did she miss the longevity longevity gene? I don't know. For sure. For sure. And for me, it's... I love how you started when you asked the question. Mm. Failure is part of business. Mm. But people don't understand... Mm. Closing the doors of business is part of business. Mm. And closing one door of a business doesn't mean that you can't start another one. Mm. You know, the failure of a project doesn't mean that you're a business failure. Mm. It just means you didn't get that one right. Mm. Do the next one that you can get right. How did you recover? How do you deal with setbacks? For instance, the deal where you couldn't complete the property. Yeah. How did you? Well, it was eventually it it was eventually completed. I'm just saying that. Mm. Money was lost mm. in the process because mm. it took forever. Mm. You know, there have been deals that took forever. Investors decided this thing is taking too long. I need mm. to reinvest my money elsewhere. Mm. Right? And now what it has taught me, it has taught me to be proactive. Right? There's a deal now where an investor is saying, now nah, I'm going to pull out. But mm. I already know what to do to mm. get it right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fix it. Yes. Because I've been there before. Okay. I know now what to do to fast track certain yes. processes. And how to replace that investor. If of, you have to. If I have to. Mm. But this one is a very important investor to me mm. because the person believed in me in certain projects. So mm. I want I don't want to disappoint her. Mm. I want her to, to make the kind of returns that I promised. Mm. But I know what to do. The, mm. the, the important thing is it shouldn't just be I failed. It should also be I failed, but I learned. So how do you help these youngsters who may be watching you appreciate that really, really embrace failure or allow for failure for you to succeed yeah so you must appreciate the process mm. and and don't get into intentional failure and then say failure is part of the process mm. if you're gonna fail let it be something that's beyond your control that has happened it shouldn't you should you see the fact that you you know when when we're sitting here and we're saying failure is part of it mm. It can be counterintuitive. Yes, yes. Right, to I, say, I, yeah, I hear you. Someone would say, ah, it's okay to fail. No, it's not okay. Mm. In the sense of you rooting for failure. Mm. It's okay if it's something that you couldn't have controlled. You understand? Mm. But we do our best mm. and look at it and say, if I didn't get it right, mm. at least my best cushion is I did my best. Mm. You understand? And, and you keep picking yourself up. Anyway. And, and, and that's why we, 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 it's important to aim for the best, mm. right? And give it your best. Like I'll give you, an, I'll give you an ex, a silly example. Mm. I always say to my friends, I'm like, Chief, if I'm going to be approaching any woman mm. and say, I mean, I'm, I'm approaching, let's date. Yeah, she's to be, she's, she has to be the standard mm. that I think is a beautiful woman. Mm. You know why? Yeah. Even if she rejects me. Mm. I know, but Chief, you went for the best. <laughs> Do you understand that? I hear you. But I imagine you. someone up, someone denies you and they're not even your standard. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine the heartbreak? You're being heartbroken by... <laughs> it's a double heartbreak. Double <laughs> no, tragedy. Double tragedy. Yeah. You, you want to be able to say, mm. Oh, honey, honey. Yeah. But at least it's my standard. It's yeah. my level. Yeah. I went for the best. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> even those deals and those projects, mm. you need to be able to say, but here... Mm. I put together the best deal. Mm. 
the guy just didn't have the foresight to mm. see it. Mm. I did my best. Mm. That's it. If I'm sitting here and I'm in this podcast, even if somebody looks at it and said, ah, but that guy was talking, no, I did my best. Yes. yes. I gave it you my gave best. It best so it shouldn't be, Hore, no, even if it doesn't go well, it's part mm. of it. No, 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 no. We give it our best. All right. Here's a chance to hit me with a question, sir. Is it really more than just money? Uh, that's a question. Yeah. Is, yes. is, it, is it really more than just money? Yes. See, for instance, I said it's more than just money. Yeah. And someone might say, ah, let's, I, I want to hear a different perspective. A different perspective. My view is that it is really more than just money. Money is at the heart of it. In other words, m- money is not the impo- most important thing in the world. Yeah. But it affects most of the things that are yeah. important. Money affects love. Money affects sex. Money affects uh, business. Money mm. affects every, everything. So as much as it's not the most important thing, because yeah. I could argue that the most important thing is health. Yeah. COVID has demonstrated that. Yeah. I can argue that the most important thing is oxygen. Yes. That, that, that has been demonstrated uh, the past, in the past. Uh, but nevertheless, money is up there with oxygen. Yes. So, I would say that this title is accurate, sir. Mm-hmm. It is really, to answer your question, more than just money. Okay. So, I've got another follow-up question. Yeah. What would you advise your younger self, that young 25-year-old you that was starting out in business and was seeking to build a career in, in law, entrepreneurship, and property, what would you, if you were to look back and say, I need to advise this young, scared I'm guy? Got, I'm going to question. I yeah. understand the question. This is the way I would answer it. My, I have no regrets, zero regrets. Mm-hmm. So I would advise myself to do exactly what I did, with one exception. Okay. I would advise myself to start the actual personal development journey earlier. Hmm. When I started, I was just obsessed with the law and legalism and legalistic things. Sure. It's only in my 30s that I consciously, deliberately focused on personal development. Sure. Sometimes I say, where would I be? How far would I have gone if I had started reading, attending more seminars, um, more workshops, reading more books, uh-huh. if I had gotten into the beast mode? I got into my beast mode in my 30s in terms of focus. You know, that kind of attitude. Yeah. I adopted it in the 30s. My only regret is that I should have started doing it in my teens or late teens. Hmm. But it's not much of a regret. It's a realization. Yeah. And it's a learning learning uh, experience, which I now share with my mentees. For sure. And so personal viewers. development is at the heart of everything you've yes. built? Started early. Learn early. Develop the culture. The reason why Jews are called the people of the book yeah. It's because that they've inculcated it from, ya- from, from, from a young age. The kids learn the Torah. They, they learn the Torah, they learn the Talmud. And yeah. the Talmud, half the Talmud is about life and, 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 and money. For and, sure. and half of the Torah, anyway, is about yeah. money. You're getting me excited. Yeah, you see yeah. the smile on my so, face. Yes. So that is, that is all I can say for now in a limited setup like that. We'll talk. Me and you will we'll talk some more. For sure. Out of this. Now, here's your chance. To face the viewer that you've just uh, spoken to yeah. and climb inside their mind and motivate them as we close this discussion. So so this is probably not even going to be a motivation, mm. but it's a quote uh, by a revivalist called Leonard Ravenhill. It says, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. Meaning, opportunity is like a window. It opens and it closes. If you're young, you're not going to be young forever, which means being young is an opportunity because there are people that have missed that age that are in their 50s that wish they could have done their 20s well so that they could build portfolios for themselves. So every opportunity that we have is it's got a lifetime. You know, So the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of that opportunity. And lastly, as a young person, as an elderly person, you must be restless. And what do I mean by restless? Thomas Edison says, restlessness is discontent. And discontent is the first necessity for progress. Show me a thoroughly satisfied man, I will show you a failure. 
Now I'll repeat the quote again. It says, restlessness is discontent. And discontent is the first necessity for progress. Show me a thoroughly satisfied man and I'll show you a failure. Which just means let's not rest on our laurels and say, nah, everything is going to work out. Let's be people that are on a mission. Every day let's wake up and say, what is it that I can do? to better myself, to better my future, to better my country, to better society because we are being restless and we are using the opportunity of of a lifetime in the lifetime of that opportunity to make a difference. Wow. Ooh, you blew me away. Can you share all your contacts, sir? Yeah. In terms of both social media, physical addresses, everything. For sure. Where the books can be found, everything. Yeah. So, in... I'm Witness Mtaka on all social media platforms. Mm-hmm. Witness Mtaka on all social media platforms. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on TikTok. So that's where you're going to find me. And I'm on my website, www.witnessmtaka.com. Our office WhatsApp number is 62 you want to call in, you can call in on 010 And if you want to purchase our book here in Botswana, we've got a distributor by the name of Mr. Kumos Bereko. His number is 77 So if you're in Botswana, uh, he's based in Khaburoni. And guys, let's engage on the socials, social mm. media, Facebook, everywhere. Let's engage with one another. You've been a brilliant oh, let me guest. let me also mm. Mm. say on the Facebook side, okay. I've got two pages. It's mm-hmm. Witness Mdaka, mm-hmm. and then it's Witness Mdaka. It's more than just money. Mm-hmm. So that's my there's my page, mm. and there's the book page as well. It's more okay. than just money page. Thank you. You've been a wonderful guest. You've done wonders. Thank you so studio. much. Thank you so much for sharing so generously. Thank you so much.